chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. So we're going to be talking about um, prophecy in the Old and the New Testament. The reason we're talking about that is just to, get, just to give you some of my background. Um, I came from a super, super crazy Pentecostal background. And what I mean by that is just unbelievable stuff. Unbiblical stuff, crazy stuff happening that was not in the scriptures, completely abused what, what we find in the Bible. Because of that, I said, okay, I don't believe in any of that stuff. I don't believe in prophecy, I don't believe in speaking in tongues, I believe in healings, all that stuff is fake because I came from an environment where it was just mad crazy stuff was happening. It was dishonoring to God, it was dishonoring to the scriptures. Uh, then, as I started looking into the Bible, I said, okay, well, wait a second. I don't really have a biblical um, case for what I'm saying. Uh, we talked about it yesterday. There is no scripture that says that those, those gifts have been done away with. So I came to a point of reluctantly admitting, okay, well, I guess they're still around, but that's for the crazy people, and the crazy people do it, and I'll just stay with my mind. My mind. My intellect, you guys can be all emotional and crazy. It's still there, so whatever. Then I came to a point where the, when the Lord was like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why? If it's a gift, why would you not want it if it's a gift? Especially considering that we are told to what? First Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 14.1. Pursue love and what? Desire. Earnestly, earnestly desire them. Right? It, 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 the Bible doesn't just say... Um, well, the gifts are there, and that it says you're supposed to pursue love and earnestly desire. Now, we went over this yesterday in First Corinthians. Um, the first thing when you're talking about the gifts is love. Love God, love your fellow believer, and love your fellow not yet believer. So, anytime you're talking about exercising a spiritual gift, that's the grid you use. Okay, how is this gift going to work with loving God? How is this gift going to work with loving my brother and sister? How is this gift going to work with helping a person who's not yet my brother and sister? Well, it will be because I'm exercising this gift, right? Then it says, earnestly desire the gifts. I said, okay, well, God, I'm not really being biblical if I accept that the gifts are still there, but I'm not earnestly desiring them. Uh, so I don't usually share the story, but I feel like to share and, and whatever. So here we go. So I was praying one time. I pray a lot. I usually be here doing that. So I was praying one time. I was really, really I was going through whatever. And, uh, and I found myself correcting my prayer because it wasn't theologically accurate. It wasn't right. And God said, we will. Why are you doing that? I know your heart. I know you've got all this junk in your soul. Why would you? Um, and I said, well, you know, it's coming out the wrong way. I don't really need it that way. This is what's coming out. And God's like, I know that. Here's the deal. I know what you're really saying, even though what you're saying isn't what you need to say. I don't know if that makes any sense. That's what was going on. So I was like, all right, for a couple days, I'm going, I'm going. Um, went downstairs. That's where usually I go to pray. And I was in this really intense um, state. I don't know how else to say it. Uh, now I know what's going on. I was really in the spirit of my prayer. And as I was praying, I heard, and I didn't audibly hear, but I just heard speak. So I said, well, as I was speaking, 20 seconds later, I realized this is not English. And it really freaked me out because the last thing I wanted to be or do was be one of those people. I didn't want to be one of those people because I thought they were emotional and they didn't use their minds and blah, 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 blah. So I was really freaked out. I, I told Lee, and I didn't tell anybody for a year. Yeah. I didn't tell anybody for a year. Um, I don't know if you guys know me, but my identity in groups usually about a big brain. I don't know if anybody's ever heard that. Andrew's a brain. Andrew has an unbelievable mind. Blah, blah, blah. So it was really difficult for me to be to, to admit, which is kind of crazy, right? This is a gift, right? To admit that I was in this state where I was talking. I don't know what I'm saying. Right? Um, but it was crazy how God set me up a couple days earlier where God was like, even though you're speaking something and it doesn't, I know what you're saying. Um, and going into 1 Corinthians 14, I was like, okay, 
this is this is what was that this is what's happening to me. Is, is and Paul says, if you're going to speak in tongues, right? You need to do it in such a way that everybody, if you're going to do it publicly, there needs to be an interpreter so everybody can be edified, right? But he also says what? 1 Corinthians 14. About speaking in tongues. I'm being very, very general here. I pray that all of you would speak more than I do. That yes. He doesn't speak to men but to God. That's good. He doesn't speak to men but to God, right? And so I, so at first I was like, oh, this is crazy. And I was like, what is I'm speaking to God. It's not that bad. It's not a bad thing. I'm speaking to God in a way that only he really knows, right? Um, that's not bad at all. Um, here's, here's the other thing. What else does he say about speaking in tongues? Better to prophesy. Well, yeah, it's better to prophesy, right? So... I just shared my little bitty uh, experience with you. Hopefully, you don't think I'm crazy. If you do think I'm crazy, you probably have to write. Um, but now let's talk about prophecy. So we spent we spent some time on. By the way, questions, comments, concerns. <laughs> concerns. <laughs> what are you concerned about? Go ahead. <laughs> so let's talk about prophecy. Nobody has any questions. Go ahead, Dory. Uh, I didn't think tongues was for today because I saw the abuse in church. There was a lot of tongue speaking happening and there was no interpreting. There was a guy preaching one time and his wife put, literally pushed him out of the pulpit so that she could go off and say craziness and there was no order at all. So that's why I said, well, I don't want to do that. So that's why I said it was completely emotional on my part. It wasn't really a biblical thing. What's up? What's your position on tongues with in the room? Well, let's go to it. Well, so 1 Corinthians 14. Let's start from verse 6. So somebody read in verse 6. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking of tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? How far do you want me to go? Keep going. Even things... Without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? So likewise you, unless you utter by the tongue the words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be There are and may be so many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks. And he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Even so, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Stop. Okay, so Paul is saying, new believer or otherwise, and we're going to talk about kind of new believer in a few seconds. But you should be you should be speaking in the congregation around people in such a way that people understand what's being said. So if there, if, that's why he says, if you speak in a tongue, you should pray that you should interpret it. So you can go off in your tongues, that's fine. And especially if there's an outsider or a new believer or an unbeliever, you should be uh, making sure that an interpretation happens. Paul is very concerned about that in the text. As a matter of fact, let's keep reading down. Um, keep going. Somebody start from verse 14. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you get that give thanks to your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say, Amen to your thanksgiving? when he does not know what you are saying. Or you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Okay. 
Okay, so here's a couple things there. When he says an outsider, what does it say in your translation? Uh, verse 16. Otherwise, the blessed with the Spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider? Right? So an outsider, a person who's not familiar with how this works, right? So you're going off. The guy's not familiar with how it works. What's he thinking? Huh? I hate that. You guys are crazy. What y'all doing? Right? Uh, Paul says we don't want to do that in the church, right? You need to have concern for other people. You can't just say, oh, spirit's moving and I don't care how you feel. That's not, that's not, that's not. That's why you start with love first, right? Because if you love that guy, you're, you're, you don't want to put any stumbling block in front of that guy. And I'm not saying quench the spirit. I'm not saying that. Because the same spirit that gives tongues is the same spirit that what? Gives the interpretation. So we're not talking about quenching the spirit here, because what happens is people read that text, they go, see, you shouldn't speak in tongues at all. No. No, we're not going there. Pray that you interpret. Pray for interpreters. We've got a room full of people here. Somebody can speak in tongues. Somebody should be able to interpret. Come on. Right? But again, this is the balance that Paul has. He always balances stuff out. So I don't know if that answers your question. It does, but I have a follow-up. That's okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay, so anytime I say something, you can immediately interrupt me and ask me as many questions as you like. You can also say, that's gobbledygook, I don't believe it. You can do that too. <laughs> go ahead. Sure. Say go. I was going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> so in your experience, right, so with, your, with the experience you described earlier, speaking in tongues, right? Although although your mouth was speaking in tongues and, and so that's what you're coming out, your heart knew where you were coming from, right? Yeah. So my question is, is that if there's not someone else in the room that can interpret the tongues, is it appropriate for you to then self-interpret following that experience if there's other people in the room? Well, I, I think that's the point of verse 13, right? The one who speaks in tongues should pray that he, in, he can interpret. Right? So, yeah. well, that's what it says. Look at verse 13. Right. Right. That's what I'm saying. I did not see that either. Yes, you can. You can. And, and more than you can, you what? You should. You should. should. You should. Right? So... If I'm going there and it's hanging out there for a while, right? And this is going to get really crowded. It's hanging out there for a while. Nobody's interpreting. You should be praying, okay, Lord, what do I see? Give me something here. You should be able to interpret that. So I don't know if that answers me. Good. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. My question is, say if we're in a corporate setting like this example now, and we're praying individually, is it still okay between you and God to be for you to be praying through the Spirit, even though? I'm not doing it publicly for people to hear. It's not public for everyone. However, I'm still praying between me and God, but that there are other people around who can hear me. Is that still wrong because I'm being heard and no one's understanding what I'm saying? Uh, okay, what does the Bible say? Anybody have anything? Is, when, when you're praying, isn't it? Tongues is for self edification, right? It's not for the church. But it's a scripture. I think it's both. I think it's self and public health. I mean, I know there's a verse that describes that corporate self No, it's just separate. No, I'm just going to, yeah, there's going to be, that, that's it. Uh, there's, two, well, there's two separate things. It comes to the interpretation, or there's just speaking okay. tongues for yourself. So that's all I'm saying. Who has a verse for me, though, that deals with what she's asking about? Um... I think chapter 14, verse 26. Okay, go ahead, read it. How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a song, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two, or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there's no interpreter, let him be silent in church and let him speak to himself and to God. Okay, so he says, let him, now, now watch this, how is this not a contradiction? He says, let him keep silent and speak to himself and God. Right? He says, let him be silent in verse 28. Let him keep silent in church and speak to himself and God. What does that mean? What's going on? No, Dorian. Well, go ahead, take a shot. 
Okay. So one is he's saying in his heart, not out loud. What else? That was actually pretty good. Speaking of praying in tongues, like under my breath. Okay. One is under the breath, right? In other words, when he's talking about um, in the church, what he's saying is you're going up in front of the congregation and doing your thing. Everybody hears you. In that moment, you're basically the center of attention. Same thing with prophecy, right? Same thing with what I'm doing right now. Paul's saying, if you're doing that, nobody's interpreting, you're not interpreting, I'm not saying you can't speak in tongues, but you can't say it in such a way that, that you're you're now the focal point of the church. Does that make sense? Yeah. So whether it's in your heart or under your breath, whatever it is, Paul's not telling you to stop. He's just saying stop doing it in a public sense. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Okay? So, again, Paul's amazingly balanced here. Because you got to understand, 1 Corinthians 14, these guys in Corinth were abusing this. It was going crazy, right? They were having rap battles. Who could speak in tongues the most, right? And Paul says, hey, if no one's going to interpret, keep doing it. Just do it in a non-public sense, verse 26 through 28. Did that, did that answer the question? Yes. All right, good. Now, I was even want to talk about tongues, but there we go. Anybody have any questions about that before we move on? What is the gift that Paul tells the Corinthians that he wants them to focus on in 1 Corinthians 14? Prophecy. Prophecy. Okay, so who's in 1 Corinthians 12? Who went there? Who? Who said got it? Okay, Kyle. Who is in Ephesians 4.11? Who's in Ephesians 4? I can get there. There. Okay, and then who is in 1 Corinthians 14.5? All right, so 1 Corinthians 12, 28. God has appointed the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, and gifts of healing, helping, and ministering in various kinds of topics. Okay, so first, what? Not all people are going to prophesy. Not all are prophets. 
he says that. But right after he says that in 14, he says, go for it. I want you all to speak in tongues even more to prophesy. So this is a really important gift. I want you to understand this. This is huge. But at the same time, it's something that all of us should be going after. Right? We talked a little bit about that yesterday. Okay, now, somebody define for me what prophecy is. What is it? What is prophecy in the New Testament? Prophecy in the New Testament is to tell the future. Is that true? Personal, individual future. Speaking to a situation or circumstance, message from God. Dorian. Revelation from the Spirit. That's my son, by the way. What did I say? The apple don't fall across the street. Yeah, sometimes it does. <clears throat> what else is it? So prophecy, tell the future, personal, situation, situational, revelation from the Spirit. Anybody have anything else? Timely encouragement. Where do you get that? Where is that in the Bible? Where is that? Where is that, that prophecy functions that way? You, know, you can't, you know, you know verse, just 14.3? Yeah. 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 What does 14.3 say? He prophesies and speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. Okay, good. So edification, exhortation, and comfort. I got a friend right now who lost a very, very, very close family member, and uh, she needs some comfort for sure. Um, but she goes to a church where this stuff is not even on the radar. What would it be for her if she could have somebody speak a word from the Lord to her in her circumstance? You see... You can disagree with me on, on, on this stuff. Like, it's fine. You can be for yourself 53 and whatever we church plan for and all that stuff not for me. And I wouldn't break fellowship with you. However, that does not mean anytime you have a bad doctrine, it has consequences. And we're going to see there are other consequences to denying this gift in the church. And there have been tons of times when... I could have been comforted and you could have been comforted if we had an environment that valued this gift. At least at the level that the Apostle valued the gift. Think about this. You have the Apostle Paul. I think he knew his Bible. And he valued the gift like that. And we, we've now outsmarted the Apostle Paul and said, ah, it's not really that valuable. Well, that means that we're suffering the consequences. There is encouragement, there is edification, there is consolation. All of us could have had that we don't have because we're denying this gift. Secondly, here's the other side of it. You could be the person that gives the encouragement, the consolation, and the edification to somebody in need that you don't give because we have denied this gift. Now, not you guys, but you come from talking about. If you come from that background, that could happen, right? Are you starting to see a little bit of why Paul said, earnestly desire this? There is never going to be a time in the life cycle of a church where a person doesn't need encouragement. I mean, look at what's in the word encouragement. Courage, right? It's, you know, when you're in a battle, right? And everything is going good, you got a lot of courage, right? You know, I'm listening to this uh, stuff about, you know, it's the wars in, in Islam. They'd have these wars, and they'd all, Muhammad would always, always appoint a guy to carry the flag, you know. So you'd, you'd carry the flag, and as long as, it doesn't matter what was happening, people would get killed all around you. As long as you saw your flag there, you were good, you could keep fighting, right? But as soon as that flag went down, everybody lost their courage. And somebody would step up and pick up the flag and keep going. Okay, your prophets in your church are the people that are always picking up the flag. They're always providing some form of encouragement through the word. Now, this is not just general encouragement, man. This is somebody who's heard from God. And you know they've heard from God. And they're giving you that courage that you need to keep going when your life is horrible, right? I mean, we're kind of a little honeymoon. Oh, self-53, it's great, right? 
Y'all realize we're going to go through some really, really difficult times. And I can get up here and go, wow, you know, here is the exegetical, blah, 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 blah. But it would just be cool if somebody got up here and just gave a word of prophecy that everybody knew was from the Lord to get our courage back, right? I'm right. saying right now, right. start working on it. Because when that comes, I'm not going to be the guy that's going to go and deliver that, right? I mean, I, I pretty much got my lane. Prophecy is not my lane. I'll pray for it. But I hope to God that one of you would be that person and not me. Everybody's discouraged. You come around and pick up the flag. We're good to go. You put courage back in us, right? We keep going. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in Paul's mind, that's really important. You're never going to have a time when you're not going to need encouragement. You're never going to have a time when you don't need to be built up, right? It's never going to be a time in the church when we don't need consolation. How many of you know in the next three or four years, people in this room, look, ladies and gentlemen, we're in a fallen world. So you're going to need some consolation. Right? This girl, I mean, she lost somebody really, really important her. And I don't know what's going to happen with us. And, and I'm not speaking any death over her. You know, I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is that, what does Paul, what does Jesus say? In this world, you will have what? Tribulation. Love to. But Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. Well, if that's true, I need some consolation. Okay. Okay. Good question. <coughs> Would you say then that prophecy could be, I don't want to use the word small, but I have to. As small as just somebody sending you a passage that they think is kind of cool, but it hits you at that moment when you need it. So that's a really interesting question. I'll tell you why it's an interesting question. So I've got this friend <coughs> that sends me Bible passages randomly out of nowhere, and the Bible passage fits the situation I'm going through like a glove, and I say, why did you do that? They're mature enough in the spirit to know the Lord told me to do that. Now, this person, in my mind, is an extremely prophetic person, so I would agree with you, um, yes, that would be a form of a prophetic form of it, because that fits the encouragement, and it's how, how did you know that that specific verse... In that specific moment, I needed it, right? Um, so I, I agree. That's a word of knowledge, right? Yeah. Very, very close to the word of knowledge. I would define prophecy as, okay, hearing from God about a specific situation or about a specific uh, event in a person's life that results in encouragement, blah, 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 blah. Okay? Now, um, I'm not going to say that. Let's go to Numbers chapter 11. Let's go in the Old Testament. When you're there, let me know. Okay, stand up and read. Nope, just verse 29. Just that one verse? Yep. Any day, brother.
No, all we just said these people were prophesying. Good question. Right? So there were other people who were prophesying during the time of Moses. Now here's the question. Were they viewed at the same level as Moses? No. Where is your textual proof of that? Very good. I agree. Numbers chapter 12. Who's in Numbers chapter 12? 6 through 9. John, you're hogging all the uh, readings. I'm sorry. Wait. <laughs> Numbers chapter 12, verses 6 through 9. He said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision. I shall speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful to all my household. With him I speak mouth to mouth, even openly and not in the dark sayings. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then was he not afraid to speak against my servant, against Moses? Okay, so think about this. We're in the Old Testament now. There are prophets in the camp. Sure, God, God agrees. But then there's Moses. Ever see that? you got other prophets, but God's saying they're not like Moses. Moses is a completely different class than these other prophets. You see that? So you got your capital P prophet, and then you got lowercase prophets in the, in the camp of Israel. However you want to say it, tier one, tier two, I don't care how you say it. All I'm saying is it was obvious that Moses was a prophet in a way that these other guys were not. Agree, disagree. You can disagree. It's okay. Talk to me. Questions, comments, concerns? So Moses was um, a prophet or a No, you didn't have apostles at the time. I know, but let's say Old Testament said he was more like the prophets he had carried by carrying for four years. Well yeah, yeah. And he was a Well yeah, the apostle wasn't even enough. Okay. I mean but he has to take the
from New York to California, right? We talked about that. It's coast to coast. Yeah. Matter of fact, look at 14. Look at the very next verse after that. The next verse of the next chapter. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. The word of Samuel came to all Israel, right? So Dan and Beersheba means all Israel, just so you know when you're reading your Old Testament, right? So Samuel is the prophet. Was he the only prophet during that time? Who said no? Who said no? Where is that in the Bible, that there were other prophets during the time of Samuel? Well, I can say we're going to talk about Samuel that um, was in, um, who was the guy that he was going to be with? Yeah, wasn't he on Samuel? Yeah, Samuel. 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 After that, you shall come to Gibeah and Elohim, where there is a garrison of Philistines. And there, as soon as you come to the city, you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place of the park, and bring food and wire before the prophets. Okay, so you will meet a group of what, Kyle? Prophets. Prophets. So Samuel is telling um, Saul, you're going to go and you're going to meet these group of guys. That they're prophets, and they're going to be prophesying. So. These people were prophesying during the time of Saul. I mean, during the time of Samuel, which is also the time of Saul. So you had Samuel, and then you had these other prophets. They were prophesying. Is that clear? Now, what is interesting about that text? What is mentioned about these prophets there, Mr. Mr. Kyle? Huh? They were instruments. Read it again. This is the instrument part. With heart and bring food and life for them from. Okay, so there is a connection between instrumentation and prophecy. First Chronicles chapter 25, verse 1. Even the Jews of his service also set apart in his service, the sons of Asaph and of Enon and who prophesied with liars and heart and the symbols. Okay, they prophesied with what? Music, things. Music thing, liars, hearts, and symbols, I think it says. That's, 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 that's not really uh, germane to my point, but it's, it's a very interesting observation that there's a connection between prophecy and music. Why is that? Okay, so there's worship to God, right? And as, I mean, what is prophecy? Who is giving us the prophecy? It's God, right? So this is where you're exalting God. God says, you know what? I'm going to tell you something that you didn't know before, that you wouldn't know unless I told you. Which reminds us that this is not pocus pocus stuff. This is about seeking the face of God ultimately. Right? It's not about, ooh, I want to give you, I want to impress you with the fact that I know something that I shouldn't know. No, what's happening is God's saying, okay, here's my people. They come to worship me. Okay? They've got some instrumentation going. They're, they're about me. I'm going to go reveal myself to them. Because what are you asking for when you're worshiping God? Aren't you just asking for a revelation of more of God? Right? You know, you got some of these people on TV. They're calling themselves their friends. They're so arrogant. They're so full of pride. And I'm like, God is not speaking to you, man. Because if he was, you would know that God is so holy and so mighty and majestic that you are nothing. And you would be amazed that he was speaking through. I'm amazed that you, you, you guys sit down and listen to anything I have to say, much less something prophetic. So, there is a connection between worship and prophecy because it puts you in the right state of mind to know who you are and not get arrogant about why I was able to do something. So, okay, let's go back. I'm just saying, I just want to point out, there's a connection between worship and prophecy. So, Kyle, no pressure. <laughs> Uh, okay, so what we see in 1 Samuel, though, is that it's clear Samuel was a prophet from Dan to Beersheba, but there were other prophets at the time. 
right? Were those prophets viewed on the same level as Samuel? Who's saying no? You're saying no. Okay, what is your textual evidence for that? Earlier when it refers to Samuel when it talks about his words, it says that none of his words have fallen, but it didn't reference that and didn't describe the other prophet. Okay, that's true. Any other textual evidence? Good, Kyle. First Samuel 19, verse 20. <laughs> Kyle's a bad man. First Samuel 19, verse 20. Then Saul sent messengers to take David, and when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying, and Samuel was standing, and said over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. Samuel standing is what? Head over them. Uh, I think page AD says Samuel's presiding over them, or something like that. Right? Samuel, yes, there were other prophets, but Samuel was the what? He was a leader. He was the chief prophet. He was the head over them. Very, very similar to what we see with Moses and the prophets of his day. Right? So, Heather, put that together for me. Samuel is the head over them and there are other prophets. How do you explain that? What does that mean? Say to them, this is what the Lord says, if, if, you, if you do not listen to me and follow my law, which I have set before you, and if you do not listen to the words of my servants, my servants the prophets, whom I have sent to you, to you again and again, but you have not listened, then I will make this house like Shiloh and the city of curse among all the nations of the earth. Okay, now let me ask you a question. He said, I sent my servants the prophets, right? Do you get the, the, the idea that these are people that you needed to test and examine what they were saying and decide whether or not you were going to listen to them? Was there any option of listening or not listening to this individual? No. You had to listen to this guy. It was unquestioned. You had to listen to him because it was everything he was saying was from God. Everybody see that? You didn't have the option of, okay, I'm going to, I hear what you're saying, Jeremiah, I hear what you're saying. But I'm going to go ahead and test this, and maybe I'll listen to you, maybe I won't. Did you do that with Jeremiah? Did you do that with Moses? Did you do that with Samuel? Do we have prophets like that in the New Testament? Where you absolutely have to listen to them and not test them? Yes or no? Yeah, I <laughs> that's the only one I can think of. Jesus. Is Jesus a prophet? He's the son of God. He's the son of God, but he does Was Jesus a prophet? Depends on who you ask it. No, it's a yes or no question. Was Jesus a prophet? Yes. yes. Where is that in the Bible that Jesus is a prophet? The the, the prophet. Huh? John 3. 
Good. Acts chapter 3. <laughs> Verses 20 through 22. You there? Twenty through twenty-two. That you may serve the Christ appointed for you, who heaven must receive until the time for establishing all that God spoke to Abraham by the mouth of His holy prophets from of old. Keep going. Uh, yeah, keep going. This is the important part. Moses said, "The Lord God will raise." For you a prophet from your brethren as he raised me up. You shall listen to him, and whatever he shall do, it shall be that every soul that does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came afterward, afterward also proclaim your praise. Alright, good. Okay, so so uh, Peter or Paul is referring to Deuteronomy 18. There's a prophecy where Moses says, there's going to be a prophet like me that's coming, and you have to listen to him. If you don't listen to him, God's going to judge you, right? And what, who's speaking here, Peter or Paul? I'm not sure. What Paul is saying is, that's Jesus. Jesus was that guy like Moses that you have to listen to. And if you don't listen to Jesus, what's going to happen to you? He's going to destroy you. Is that true? Yes, it is, right? In the New Testament... There is only one capital P prophet that if you don't listen to him, he's gonna, you're going you're to be judged by God. Every other prophet in the New Testament, we're called to do what with them? Test. Test. Where is that in the Bible? I feel like you just made that up, Matt. I think it's 1 John. Okay, good. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5. <laughs> First Thessalonians chapter five. Somebody once nineteen through twenty-one. <laughs> do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Good. Again, the, the amazing balance of the Apostle Paul. Do not quench the spirit. Right? And you run into a couple prophecies that don't come true. All of a sudden, people go, okay, no more prophecy. No, we're not going to do that. We're not going to quench the Spirit. Then he says, don't treat prophecy with contempt. Why would a person treat prophecies with contempt? Why would a person, why would a person have a bad attitude toward prophecy? Say again? One, it would reveal the secrets of the heart, right? So I don't like that prophecy stuff, because the guy said something about me, Billy Bear speaking with everybody, which is biblical, by the way. We're going to talk about that in two seconds, right? Um, what else? Why else would a person have an issue with prophecy? The first thing you said, where it may have been used out of hand, or, or you know, that somebody told them something that was you know, false or whatever, you know, burned them. That's right. There are some denominations where the prophet gets treated like an Old Testament capital P prophet, and nobody can question it. And so, I kind of grew up in that environment. Somebody said something, I was like, yeah, that guy's crazy. And then, How could you say that about that guy? I can't say that guy's crazy. That was crazy. I'm sorry, it's crazy. Um, and you start holding prophecy in contempt, right? I was listening to this guy who's a really very important theologian, brilliant dude, been to school literally longer than I've been alive, okay? And he said he believed in prophecy, but then somebody gave him a prophecy and it didn't come true, so now he doesn't believe prophecy at all. What? He had one bad situation and all of a sudden you're going to undo prophecy? Who's ever heard of a false teaching? Who's ever been taught something that's not biblical? Okay, that means we should just get rid of teachers. We have one false teacher means we should get rid of teachers. Is that true? No. Then why would we do that with uh, with prophecy? See, that's what Paul's saying. Don't don't hold prophecy in contempt. Don't hold prophecy in the spirit. Oh, it didn't, it didn't happen to 
you. Now you're going to hold it and get back. But what does Paul say? Paul says, okay, now accept every prophecy. No, he says, test it, right? Hold on to that which is good. Resist what's evil, right? Paul is assuming that the people in his church are mature enough in the word and in the spirit to know when something is off. You're adults. You're Christians. You don't have to be an adult. You're full of the Holy Spirit. I know you are. You'll know. You'll know. So Paul's got this confidence in the Thessalonians, which he didn't spend a lot of time with the Thessalonians, by the way. And he knew to say, hey, we're going to keep prophesying in the church, and you guys are going to be mature enough to know what's from the Lord and what's not. By praying, right? By praying. Well, look, the word test here is actually an interesting word in the Greek. In the Greek, it means to weigh critically and in detail. So it means to weigh critically and in detail. Now, don't, don't hear critically as the critical spirit. It just means listen intently, listen closely at what's being said. Right? So Paul says, Be, listen closely to what's being said. Pray. We're going to see how prayer works in this in a second, because it is in there. Um, but be critical here. Use your mind, pray, um, and then it will become clear to you if it's from the Lord or if it's not from the Lord. And some of it is mixed. We're going to see that in a second. Some prophecies are mixed. That's why he says, hold on, that's good. Resist what's not. Right? Um, okay, good. Where else are we told to weigh things? Very good. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 29. You got it. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. Going. Okay, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge, right? Uh, which tells us something. Paul put a number on the amount of people that can prophesy in church service. Why? Because, think about what's going on in the Corinthian church. Yet everybody's speaking in tongues. How do they speak to Toyota? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> right? Then, the, the prophets are like, oh, okay, I can do one better. Yo, guess what's going to happen tomorrow? Another prophet was like, oh, guess what's going to happen next week? Another guy would say, it was just absolute and total chaos. So he says, okay, you got two or three at the most. Now, I would love to have that problem with, with us, right? Can you imagine, think about this. There are so many people gifted prophetically that Paul had to say, all right, only two or three of you can have this supernatural thing in your, in your church service. That is insane. Go ahead. Do you think that it's possible that Paul is suggesting two or three prophets only to speak at a time so that everyone in a corporate environment would, would have the ability to put it to test it or, or to use that discernment about know, what they're saying? I think that was part of it, right? You got 50 people up there. You can't effectively... You cannot effectively do that because the mental faculties are being used, right? Like when you're evaluating prophecy. The word for judge there is to distinguish, to judge, to dispute. It actually has a connotation at some level of debate. Right? So that's right. You can't really, and again, it's not with a critical spirit. You're not looking at this guy suspiciously, right? But you are using your mental faculties. You are thinking. You are praying. We're going to see that in a second. So you're, you're absolutely right. That's one of the reasons why. But what I'd say is, like, I would love that, right? If, imagine if we left here on a Monday or whatever, and you're like, all right, well, i got to go next week because I had something. But there were just too many of us prophesying at the same time. Right? And that's, that, that was the environment of the first century church. That was Paul's assumption of what was going on. We got that assumption. Even, even churches that believe in this stuff, this is not happening at that, at that rate. Right? But Paul says, that's great. You guys prophesy, but make sure... You're using your mind. You need to judge these prophecies. They're really, really important that you do that. Questions, comments, concerns? Yeah, so please, um, we prophesied on you. I understand that, like, a lot of people think you guys are false prophets. But it can happen years down the road. I don't know about, like, something like that. And I was told to write this stuff down. Years 
So I've, I've had uh, prophecies about me basically my entire life. When I say my entire life, like this person told my mom, hey, you're just a woman that didn't know me from Adam. This and this and this is going to happen with your son, but then the Lord is going to do this and this, and then your son is going to do this, this, and that. I remember when my mom sat me down and I was 11 years old, she explained the whole thing. Right? Now, at the time, even at 11, I was extremely skeptical. I was like, yeah, whatever. Right? All I can tell you, I'm, I'm 30 years old now, 31. All I can tell you is it, I've seen that played out in my life. Right? Like, so that, that took, you know, 11, 31, 20 years. Okay? Um, think about this. Who told Abraham that he was going to have a son? The Lord. The Lord prophesied to Abraham he's going to have a son. That means the next day he had a kid? No. Wrong. How long did it take Abraham to have a son? Yeah, 20 uh, years. 20 years. Kind of like me. Yeah. Well, 20 years seems to be the number, right? So there is a biblical uh, precedent for prophecies taking some time, right? Now, Jesus also came back and said, hey, next year this time you're going to have a son, right? So, so the, the prophecy increased. You have prophecies that, that um, confirm previous prophecies. All I want to say is that if taking a long time means a person's a false prophet, it means God was a false prophet. We don't want to go there, right? Because it took Abraham 20 years for him to have a kid. Same thing happened to Isaac. God showed up and said, Isaac, you're going to have a kid. It took Isaac a bunch of years to have a kid too, right? Very good question. Yeah, Joseph prophesied that his parents were going to bow down and his brothers were going to bow down on him. That also took him a long period of time. Right? What's up, Larry? Say again? You have two And you have two. Yes. You probably have two. I'll tell you about it later. At least. Okay. All right. So let's go to some actual prophecies in the New Testament. Let's see how this actually works, right? So now we've, we've got a couple categories. Oh, I didn't know. We got a couple categories, right? One, you've got your tier one prophet and your tier two prophet, right? What's happening in the New Testament is that the tier one prophet is Jesus, and then we're the we're the tier two guys. They are to be active in the church, but they are to be tested, diligently tested, right? That's what we have so far. They are to be encouraging, edifying, consoling. It is rev revelation from the Spirit, and we're going to see that. Uh, in this one, it's going to be situational. Acts chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Uh, 
uh, famine, all right? Or, or there's going to be a terrorist attack, whatever, right? And then it says the disciples came together and they said, all right, what are we going to do about this? What they do? They determined to send relief. They used their mental faculties. They took what they heard from the prophet, and then they came up with a plan, right? Think about this. This is the marriage of the spirit and the mind. Spirit prophesies there's going to be a famine. What do these guys do? They use their minds. Since there's going to be a famine, we need to get a collection up so that we can go support our brothers and sisters down over there. As they had need. I mean, as they were felt led to do or whatever it says in the text, right? That's what it says. You, you want to go somewhere? Uh, uh, <laughs> see what I did there? Yeah, I yeah, did. Yeah. Okay. So uh, think about that. They used their minds in, in response to what they heard from the Spirit. And then what did they do? This is the last part of that verse. Uh, they sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Now, this, is, this is unbelievable. Barnabas and Saul were there. Who did the prophesy? Agabus. Agabus. Here, here is something that we see about the life of the early church. In the life of the early church, Yes, you had big, important people like the Apostle Paul there in your midst. But you can just be some random guy, Agabus. Now, he was a random guy because he was recognized as a prophet. But just look at the team dynamic of the early church. Paul didn't stand up and say, look, I'm Paul, okay? I'm going to be the one that's delivering this you know, problems. Nor does it say that Paul was the one that came up with the solution. Paul's the one that actually was the guy that said, all right, Paul, we're giving you the money. Go, go take us to the elders. Paul didn't do the prophecy. Paul wasn't the guy heading up the, the solution pattern. This shows you about leadership in the early church. Paul was actually the guy that was the workhorse that delivered the money. So even though, remember we said, oh, that's really self-serving, Paul, you put the apostle up there. Paul wasn't really the central guy in this narrative. If you would have been there in the early church and you didn't know anybody, who would you have thought was the leader or the important person? Probably would have thought Agabus, right? You wouldn't even have seen it. Oh, who's Paul? And yet he was one of the he was one of the major leaders in the church. But he is not central in this narrative. He's actually, you know, delivering the things now. This is unbelievable to me about how the early church operated. Right? You can have recognized leadership in the church. That's fine. But if the gifts are operating at the level that they should be, depending on the situation, stuff like this can and should happen. Does that make sense? Questions, comments, concerns. Okay, let's go to another one. And I want to think about, let's think about similarities and differences now in reaction to prophecy. Acts chapter 13, 1 through 3. What happened when you got some brother? I was just seeing how this completely blows up a lot of church environments you grown up in. Uh -huh. What do you mean? How you say a church is supposed to operate where the gifts are being used in church, they completely throw them out. They're doing it in church. Right. It's so structured. Yeah. Yeah. My question is going to be, is this how you keep, you know, seeking the gifts alive in the church is to keep this discussion going, keep it open as a unit. Because I see that a lot in practice and stuff like I talked about, like, you need to slam you bring up Tommy, you need to put this out of control the topic. You know, I, I just think that it's not enough to get There's people here that can prophesy. That has to be, you know what I mean? I agree with you. It needs to be, this question needs to stay open all the time, right? Until it's happening. Yeah. So the church can go strong as a whole. No, I agree completely. But with prophecy, so uh, I guess I'm confused. Prophecy versus tongue, both you have to sincerely be pursuing each gift, right? I mean, you keep like, those versus tongues, right? You have to be pursuing love and then also in faith, earnestly pursuing both prophecy and tongue. So, I mean, I've never earnestly pursued prophecy or tongue. You know? And I don't know, I mean, has anybody, I mean, I guess it's not really appropriate to ask that to the group, but like, ask it. Yeah, just throw it out there. Just do that. 
Has, any, has anybody earnestly pursued prophecy or tongues? I have not. Yeah, I remember. It came because you earnestly saw it. I got baptized and always do. The evidence is being pumped. And that was called the call again. I didn't understand it. only saved me once. So I spoke to a couple of elders in the church, told me it's back to practice speaking in tongues. To get this communication open to God. So I did, I just, you know, I, I just wanted to give some spirit. I was led by the spirit, I wanted to give, so. <laughs> What, this is what I'm saying, is that if, if we're saying that in order to receive the gift of tongues, that we have to earnestly pursue that and, and also pursue that love, and the same is true for prophecy, and we're saying that it would be great if we, if we in a corporate setting, could have people two or three at a time prophesizing, you know, because you earnestly pursue tongues, but have to earnestly pursue prophecy. I'm hungry for you to hear from my grandfather that I was prophesying to you. Backed out and asked God for little patience on this for a little time because I'm really saved. I didn't want to hurt anybody. You know what I mean? I didn't want to fall across the side of anybody. So I'm playing with that with God right now, but I'm keeping that. Yeah, that, I guess that's what I'm asking. Because I have it. I feel like I could be used in that area. So I really want to be sure I'm not prophesying. You know, I'll pump with people and encourage people. You know what I mean? If you all as I'm prophesying that way with people, I will pray in tongues with them, encourage them afterwards, you know, with a little bit of prayer in English. Is that correct? Is that okay? I mean, I'm just kind of figuring this out. Maybe it's a better knowledge, but I, mean, I haven't read a lot of this, but I'm feeling it. Well, yeah, and, and that's that's my role, right? Is to teach and say. So there's a couple reasons why I'm teaching on this. One is because, as you see in the New Testament, I want to convince you that you could do this. Right? Well, well. Two is I want you to get jealous and be like, well, they did it. How can we do it? Right? And it's one of the things I've been looking at for years is looking at the book of Acts and going, where is this church? Where is it? Right? And I want you guys, I want you guys to, to, to be asking that question when we're going over this stuff. When we talked about healing a couple weeks ago and prayer and, and prophecy and tongues, right? And you're seeing this stuff in the New Testament. I want you guys going away going, where is this? Because the more we learn about it, the more that desire for pursuit happens, right? Um, so you got to be taught at some level so that you can know that, that you should have a desire. B, you want to make sure that everything is completely and totally biblical. You never see, I'm not, I'm not going after anybody. I'm not going after anybody or whatever. But you never see Paul telling people to practice Never happens, right? They lay hands on them and they receive the gift, or they earnestly pursue it and they receive the gift like that. So it's never an incremental, gradual thing where they have to practice. It. So that's one thing I would one thing I would caution you against. Okay. Let me ask you this: um, I'm baptized and all the good evidence is even done. It just came out of me, you know. And so I, I, I just felt this feeling of bliss, overwhelmed, renewed, like. Filled with God, like the Holy Spirit was strong, and I chased that hot. I wanted to hide back. I, I, I was seeking God. I mean, I was, I just, I let all my walls down. I was letting the Spirit in, and I couldn't get that support feeling back. That speaking in tongues. One of my weakest moments was that somebody false teaching, telling me to practice speaking in tongues. What I would say is, if you don't see a biblical example for it, then you want to stay away. You want to stay away. From Right? So unless you can find one, then yeah, I'm, no, I don't, I'm open to it. But if you don't see difficult examples, yeah, yeah. you probably want to stay away from it. That's good to know. So that's, that's why I don't want to prophesy with all people. Because I've told people to practice praise and tongue. So I was taught both. You know, I was both taught. Now that teaching is going on. So I'm glad you're right to be Well, this is one of the reasons why I think, in, this is one of the reasons why in our environment, I say at any time, stop me. And that's why I said you can tell me it's gobbling you or whatever. Right? Because you cannot, I don't care how gifted you are as a teacher, you don't get to tell people stuff and not prove it, right? So, so anything I'm telling you, you gotta find, you, you 
got, I got a chapter and verse you. If I can't chapter and verse you, then forget it. And, you know, what's the big phrase in C53? What's the question we ask all the time? Where is that in the Bible? I don't care who you are. We're going to ask you that question. It's not there. We're not doing it. Let me go for a quick. What do you mean by you? You're telling people to practice to you. Tell people that have never spoken tongues before? Yeah, I was told by Elita. She's taught me a lot in my walk. So every day I was at a town fundraising and I'd be on the side of the side of the hotel man talking to God, praying the tongue. Talking to it. You know, I, I wanna edify myself in his prayer. So I would just speak out in tongues and put some thought in himself. So it's like prophetically flowing tongues now, like like you know, worship you kind of stuff. Yeah, like I'm not confused that. I think I'm missing something. Are you saying when you is, you, is that normal? I, 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 might, I might have missed the term. When yeah, you I said practice, right. here's what I heard when you said practice. It's a good point. Yeah. So I have heard of situations where the the pastor say, oh, you want to speak in tongues? Okay, yeah. let's try it. Now, on the Mitsubishi, literally, like, yeah. okay. just say the same these syllables yeah. over. Now, what is that? Ah. Okay. All right. Good Good, good job. Good clarification. Okay. okay. Good, 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 good. I'm like, I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. I'm like, I'm back. Oh, okay. So, so let's, 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 let's make the dichotomy, right? So what I'm talking about when he said practice, I thought you meant um, the person coming and saying, okay, you want to speak in tongues, repeat these syllables after me, and keep repeating them, and then, you know, it'll kickstart the Holy Spirit. Really? Yeah, people will do that. People I, would, do that. I, I do laugh at something. <laughs> no, but if you mean practice by um, continue to do it. Yeah, it's just me and God talking. You know, like, okay, that's, 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 okay, that's, that's the majority of the power of the people. All right, that's good. Earnest pursuit. So I'm very, yeah, yeah. I'm very, very. This is good. This is why we need to ask each other questions and not assume. Good job. Yeah, good. like, like, like you mentioned to me before. Like a lot of people won't ask questions and they want to win. Sometimes it takes a month for questions. Yeah, no stupid questions. I agree. There are no stupid questions. Yeah, I'm so hungry for this. I don't have ice on. No, for so many times I have ice on. I'm trying to do it all. No, no, no. Ben, that's not that. You don't. You I don't, don't feel stupid. I don't feel. Stupid. Acts chapter 13. No, you're good, bro. Acts chapter 13. Uh, His name is Eric. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. It is now. <laughs> <laughs> Acts chapter 13. Somebody, let me know when you're there. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, 1 through 3. Superstars to function across the church. So I would 
I would in that moment, you think they put that all together? If they had someone who, who had that, yeah. From now on, yeah. Okay. So we, we've got a couple votes for Edify. Personal. No, personal. Say again? No, the top. Personal. You're saying it's in person? You're saying it's personal? Yeah. We got another vote for personal. Me too. I had personal for What else? Yeah, it's personal for Song Barthas. You're right. What else? Situation. Was it situational? Yeah. It's quite a few things, right? Here's another one I didn't put down. It was also directional, right? It's giving a direction. You need to do this because the other one wasn't. The other one was there's going to be a famine, and that's all it said. This one is different. Set aside. We're going to actually do something. Now, how did they react in the first prophecy we saw? They got organized. They got organized, and they used their brains, right? And they gave and they gave Barnabas this all money. How did they react in this one? Did they get organized and start planning? What does it say they did after they heard that word? They kept fasting and praying. Okay, this is different. Why did they, why the difference? So in the first one, they're like, oh, okay, damn it, let's get together. Let's figure this out. What's going on? This one, they keep fasting and praying. What's the difference? Say again? I wasn't saying it wasn't good for Well, you was like, well, are they really edified? <laughs> so, so they wanted to pray so that the word wouldn't come true? <laughs> well, they, might, they may have been testing the word, for right. starters, being sure it was true, and then also being prepared to lay hands on them and send them off. Okay, so there might have been some, are you sure this is from the Lord, man? <laughs> like, I saw you had a fight with the Apostle Paul, now all of a sudden Paul needs to leave the church, right? That didn't happen. I'm just saying, the, the, this situation, it seems, in the first situation, everybody said, you know what, you're absolutely right. Everybody got the sense of this was from the Lord. In this situation, it seemed that people were like, well, we need to do some more praying on that, right? Part of examining, you talked about this, part of examining and testing and things like that is praying and fasting. That's part of it. So yes, use your prayer. We saw that in Acts chapter 11, right? But another part of testing and things like that is, okay, we got this word through prayer and fasting, right? Because the word came in the context of them praying and fasting. Remember, worship? Worship creates prophecy in the Old Testament. What do we see? They're praying and they're worshiping, it says. They said, okay, that's where the word came from. Now let's pray and fast for God to confirm that word to us. Right? There may have been some elements in the church that were saying, yeah, this is great. Go ahead. There may have been some other elements in the church that were like, man, I don't know. Right? So they prayed and fasted as a group. They got confirmation. They laid hands on Paul and Barnabas and sent them out. So you've got a directional, personal, situational prophecy. This time around, though, there's a lot more at stake. They're like, all right, well, we need to be praying about it. Right? Again, this wasn't just, oh, we're just going to do whatever you say. Right? But they also didn't discount it either. And again, Paul was an apostle. And he listened to what these people had to say. He listened to what they had to say after prayer and the word. But again, this is how the church functions, right? Because if prophets could have said, look, we're number two on the list. Why do we need to even keep talking about this? Is that what they said? They said, no, okay, let's get back into praying and the word. Don't get defensive, by the way. If you start getting really prophetic in the union and people start testing you and start questioning you, you have no right to be defensive. If somebody wants to test you, you should be open to being tested. There's another thing. If you're going to stand up here and teach, I hope you're fine with being questioned. I hope you're not wielding your gifts. Oh, yeah. but again, this is a love thing, right? If you truly love the person and they are not convinced that what you have to say is completely true, would the loving thing to do is, is to say, okay, let's be and pray about it and see if the Lord gives confirmation. Isn't that the loving thing to do? That's why Paul says, seek love in your gift first. So that when the group says we need to pray and fast about this, you don't get all in your feelings and get offended. Because if you love the person, you'll realize it's not about how I feel. 
the spirit has to come and confirm what I feel to everybody else. Does that make sense? Questions, comments, concerns? What was the name of that guy who gave the prophecy in Acts chapter 11? All right, good. Let's go to Acts chapter 21. <coughs> What's up, boss? You got something? No, I just, uh, I, I, got, I guess I got a question. Uh, we have these prayer meetings, and, um, you know, sometimes the worship leader or whoever leading the worship starts singing, and, and, you know, prophetically. And I see the spirit moving, like, uh, I'll be, like, you know, singing in tongues and just getting into worship and guys are being in the presence and all. You know, pe people's words are flowing mouth to mouth. They can't hear me over there. Right? And they're, they're coming out the same way as you're not thinking and praying. Not, not, not the same tongue language, prayer language, but um, is that good? Is that, I mean, is, is that exalted God if um, prophetically singing? So you're harmonizing, speaking in tongues. So you're singing, and then other people are saying what you're singing? Yeah, that, that, yes, that's, that's what we see in 1 Corinthians 14, right? If somebody speaks in tongues or sings in tongues, Paul says, another person's interpreting it. I would take, when you said they're saying what you're thinking. No, I'm, I'm trying to see if I'm developing this gift, I'm speaking this gift. Is that, that definitely the gift of prophecy coming on, coming on you, right? So when, so say it again, so when you're... Is that, a, is that a word now? Is I'm prophetically like singing, speaking in tongues, I'm uh, saying, saying, all right, Jesus, a uh, friend of sinners or something, so that guy over there comes out the same thing. And there's confirmation? He can't handle it. He has confirmation. That's great. Good. Yeah, no, that, that's the Holy Spirit. I know that. Yeah. It's moving and moving around. Yeah. I think he's asking what kind of gift it is. So what kind of gift is it? Yeah, it says prophetic. Right? Can I answer your question? Yeah, and it would be correct too sometimes. Yeah, that is. That is I'm getting lost in the question. I get lost in the question. No worries, brother. I'm hungry, but I get that. My, my wheels turn and I don't get out of the sky. No worries. Acts chapter 21. This is a really, really, really interesting verse. Verse 8. Uh, who's got a loud voice? Daniel, go. Acts chapter 21, verse 8. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's part tied his own hands and feet with it and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people were pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, The Lord's will be done. All right. So, <clears throat> this guy comes up to Paul and says, man, this is going to happen to you. Everybody says, Paul, this means you shouldn't go. Paul says, guess what I'm doing? I'm going to listen to what you guys say. Is that what Paul said? No. Did Paul think about it? Yes. Did he think about it? Is that the text that Paul no, thought about? No, no. Did he pray about it? No. No. He said, no. No. Go on. Now, how do we put that together? He knew he had to go. Say again? God had spoken to him. He knew he had to go. He wasn't, he wasn't going to listen to man. He was going to go. But these guys were getting a prophetic word, though. Was the Lord wanting to talking to the Well, yeah. Gentiles aren't in Jerusalem. The apostles are in Gentiles. They were in Jerusalem. Anybody see the problem here? This is still at the time when the Romans were in charge. The Romans were Gentiles. Yeah, but it says the Jews are going to do this. Go ahead. I'm going back to chapter 20. Okay, Acts chapter 20. Why is that relevant, Jeremy? Because it gives the context 
or why Paul would ignore them. Verse 22. And see now I, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. Stop. So in Acts chapter 20, the Holy Spirit had already told him, look, dude, you're going to go to Jerusalem, and this horrible stuff's going to happen to you. So then in 21, when a legit prophet shows up and says, hey, this is going to happen to you, you should not do it. Right? He's not going to listen to them. Again, this shows that a prophet in the New Testament does not function like those capital P guys in the Old Testament. You could weigh and test what Moses and Jeremiah had to say and then say, I'm not going to listen to you. I've already heard from God. Right? You couldn't do that. But in the New Testament, even though the guy is a recognized prophet, right? Agabus is a recognized guy. We saw that in chapter 11. Think about the type of sway Agabus had. He said one word in chapter 11. Nobody thought about anything. They just did what he said, including Paul, right? So this, is a, this dude is a recognized prophet. Even that guy, Paul says, nope, not listening to you. I already got a word from the Lord, right? Now, here's the deal. Did Agabus see correctly what was going to happen to Paul? Did he see completely correctly what was going to happen to Paul? No. No? What happened? Did the Jews did the Jews tie up Paul and send him to the Romans? No. That didn't happen. Let's read the narrative. Who's there? Um read verse 31. So there's Paul, he's preaching to the Jews. Verse 31. Somebody read verse 31. 2131. While they were trying to kill him, the news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. The commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another. And since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. Stop. Who, who arrested Paul? The Romans, the commander. Thus says the Lord. This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will buy the man who owns this belt and deliver him over to the Gentiles. Is that what happened? No. No. The Jews did not bind up Paul and send him to the Romans. The Romans came and bound up Paul to rescue him from the Jews. They weren't trying to bind him up and send him anywhere. They wanted to kill him. This means, obviously, that Agabus is a false prophet. Is that true? Does, does, the new, does, the, does the narrative ever say, and so Agabus was a false prophet? No. So somebody explain to me what happened. What he saw was Paul bound in chains, and he interpreted that as the Jews are going to arrest you, blah, blah, blah. So this gives us an insight into the prophetic. You can see something and interpret it wrongly. Because what happened is, Agabus interpreted it wrongly, and then the people applied it wrongly. Because what they told him was, you shouldn't go. Uh, Janine said that was actually confirmation of uh, his earlier verse in chapter 20, right? What they should have done is say, okay, Paul, we need to pray for you because you need to go down there no matter what, right? What they should have done in the application of the prophecy was pray for Paul to have strength and send him down there, right? But what they did in the application of what they did with the application was you can't go down there. Right? So there was a misinterpretation of what was seen and then a misapplication of what was seen. Which is why the scriptures tell us we need to what? Test the prophecies. One of the ways that you test prophecy is what are you hearing from God? What are you hearing from the Holy Spirit? Right? Okay. Questions, comments, concerns? What do you got, John? Actually, um, when Paul appealed to Caesar, um, 
being bound by the Romans was the greatest blessing to the church because if he hadn't been bound by the Romans, we wouldn't have the scriptures as we have it today because he did most of his writing in, in prison. That's right. He would have been dead long ago. He would never have survived that long because the Jews were out to kill him. And uh, so he could never have survived. So actually being bound was, we think of that imprisonment as, oh, that's bad. Actually, that was how God was protecting him from the Jews. That's, that's, that's right. It is exactly right. So what that shows us is you can see something in the spirit. I don't know how this worked for Agabus. What Agabus saw in the spirit was probably a bunch of Jews and Paul being tied up and Romans, right? And so he looked at that and he goes, oh, the Jews did that to Paul. And then when he said, this is what I saw, a bunch of Jews, he said it incorrectly. And then they said, you can't go. When in reality, we probably don't have the book of Romans, we don't have Philippians, we don't have, uh, I don't know if he wrote Corinthians from Jim, right? But to his point, that's exactly where Paul needed to be. Right? This is why you need to test prophecy. Right? Because even though you have a guy that's a legit prophet, Ag Agabus is a legit prophet, it's clear there that he was off. I've had that. I've had like super prophetic people in my life say, man, you shouldn't do X, Y, and Z thing. And I was like, I don't know. I'm praying about it. I feel like I need to do this. And it turned out that that person was not right. I needed to go X, Y, and Z thing, right? Doesn't mean they're a false prophet. Doesn't mean whatever. It's just I needed to test it. So we need to test it. We need to have a prophetic environment, but we also need to have an environment where everybody's open to being tested. Notice what Paul, they said, look, we tried to convince Paul. What does it say at the end? Paul, you're rebellious, you're stubborn. What do they say? The Lord's will be done. There's no animosity towards Paul. There's no accusation that Paul is being rebellious. There's no accusation that Paul is calling them false teachers. None of this extreme language. Everybody just says, okay, we're going to agree to disagree. The Lord's will be done. That's how disagreements about the prophetic work in the church play. I just wanted to add about uh, being willing to be tested. In Acts 17, 11, the Bereans were testing Paul, who was an apostle, you know, capital A apostle. And John, in Revelation chapter 2 of the church of Ephesus, references being tested. The testing those who call themselves apostles who found out they were false. So even guys like Paul and John were willing to be tested. So who is any of us to, to not? And here's the thing. Agabus, after seeing how the whole thing plays out, is going to grow, right? He's going to go, okay, well, I was off there. Uh, I need to rethink that the next time, right? But what I'm saying is we're all discipling each other, right? That's the big thing about self We're all discipling each other. So if a prophecy happens and there's a disagreement, Instead of taking it as a time to disagree with each other and get all emotional, take it as a time for discipleship. So the agonist is saying, look, if I'm right, you'll learn. And if, if you're right, we'll learn. So let the Lord's will be done. Which is why love has to cover all of this. Because the only way we're going to be able to disagree with each other and something as important as that is if we truly love each other. Agnes knew when he looked Paul in the face that Paul loved him. Paul was disagreeing, and he's saying, what does Paul say? Why are you, what, breaking my what? My heart. That's love language. That's not, you nasty false prophet. You coward, which is some silly thing I probably would have said. You're a coward. You just don't want me to go because you don't want to suffer, or some silliness like that. Right? That's not what Paul said. Paul said, why are you breaking my heart? Right? He said, I love you guys. And Agabus is saying, looking at Paul, going, all right, man, boys will be done. We love you, but whatever. Right? Okay. So, somebody had a question? John. The, uh, uh, the early church had its own checks and balances. But there were times when, uh, when uh, people, like for example, uh, Ananias and Sapphira, when they lied to the Holy Spirit, God steps in. You do not lie to the leader of the church, which is the Holy, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. That's what happened. There was, uh, you talk about that prophecy, there was no, you did this, you're, that's it. They're going to drag you out. They're going to take you out. Um, God's, the reason that 
uh, most churches are set up wrong. They're set up with a leader that everybody is following. Therefore, they're not growing spiritually because they're following some leader. Uh, what did Christ say? Let, let those that are the greatest among you be your servants. And those that are the least, uh, everybody is to be led of the Spirit. Every single person. Yeah, I mean, so Paul, I mean, Paul explicitly says, look, the elders are going to rule the church and blah, 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 right? I mean, we know that there's leaders in the church, but to John's point, you don't, A, as a leader, you don't get to just throw around all your authority, right? We've already saw, we've already seen Paul's example where he gets sent off to this other church on the basis of a prophetic word. He gets sent to deliver money on the basis of, you don't get to throw around your authority if you're a leader. At the same time, if you're not in a co-leadership position, you still need to be walking in the spirit and doing all this because at any given time, you need to be ready, Janine, to throw something out there. Right? The Lord might tell you, Janine, look, you know, Country Kitchen's going to blow up tomorrow or something. I don't know. Right? But you got to be ready. Right? Um, th so that's that's the big thing that I wanted, wanted to emphasize here. This is something that is available, I'm not going to say to all of us, but to most of us if we would go after it. Um, and I, I would plead, I would plead with you, you know, think about this. We've had, we've had directional, we've got situational, we've got personal. Look at all these these ways that prophecy operates in the church. Here's here's the deal. You know, we church plan. What are the ways that we're going to make decisions? Like when you're at a fork in the road, you're at a fork in the road. How are you going to make decisions? Are you going to make decisions by saying, oh, well, this would be the best financially, and this would be this, and let's look at our, you know, whatever, hold on, yeah, by prayer, but wouldn't it be cool if we had a prophetic person that says, I got that? You're just going to just walk completely in the flesh, or are you going to rely on your teammates, right? This is, this is not just, it would be cool for you personally to have a prophetic gift. Think about this. This is the reason why many of our churches don't need the Holy Spirit. Take these guys out of your church. Take prayer out of your church, and then you come up with the, what's the most efficient or financially feasible or whatever decision that you make in the church. I don't want to make decisions that way, guys. I'd be late, right? Yeah. I don't want to run anything like a corporation. I'm in a corporation. I know how we make decisions in a corporation, right? You got a PL, you look at your PL, you look at where you want to go, and you're, and you're blah, 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 blah. That's how you make decisions. This is the church of Jesus Christ. We don't make decisions like corporations. Okay. And one of the ways, yeah, one of the ways that, the, that we've seen in Acts is the church made decisions by gathering, praying, fasting, worshiping. We have prophets in there. It's one of the ways you make decisions. Go ahead. Um, Paul said that he would like everybody to speak in tongues, but even more desire prophecy. Mm -hmm. Did I just hear you correctly say that? You don't think that's available to everybody? First Corinthians 12, Paul says, do all prophesy. <clears throat> the implication is no. He says, are all prophets, are all apostles, do all heal, do all prophesy? The implication is no, 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 no. Um, so that being the case, I'm not saying that everybody here couldn't. What I'm saying is I don't think I can scripturally say that everybody here will because of First Corinthians 12 is a place. Good question. Um, Sorry. I was just going to say that um, if everyone were to prophesy and speak in tongues, you, you would almost, I would make the argument that, that it would almost devalue the gift, right? So if everybody that claimed to be Christian or everybody that was Christian was prophesying and speaking in tongues, would we, would we as a group be able to discern, okay, this is what's coming from the Holy Spirit, this is who's doing it for the sake of doing it, um, and etc. I don't know, I don't know. It's almost, it's almost... Um, I, I find it, it's almost more impactful if it's coming from a, uh, if the Holy Spirit sort of, that gift's going to a, a select few. And what time are the old I'm going to wrap it up soon. I'm going to wrap it up soon. Yeah, so I'm sort of in, in between you guys, right? Because I don't think it's a few because of Paul telling the church to keep pursuing it, but I don't think you can say it's everybody. But I do think, you know, um, one of the gifts in First Corinthians well, is the discerning of spirits, right? Now somebody's got a real good discernment, right? So you got a bunch of people prophesying, and I'm going to say, good, now we got direction in the church. I'm going to say, wait a second, I got my discernment guy. Hey, what do you think about that? Right? See how all the gifts work together? 
this is how we're going to make decisions. We're not going to go and, you know, and I'm not saying we're not going to use our minds because we already saw that, right? We saw that. They use their minds, right? So I'm not saying we're going to just chunk the mind out of there. We got mind and spirit operating at the same time. Right? So I want to, I want to, I want a bunch of prophetic people, and then I'm going to have some discerning people, and then I'm going to have some teaching people. Going to say, wait a second, doctrinally that's off, right? So the discerning guys are like, there's something wrong with that guy. I don't know what it is. Something wrong with that guy. Teaching guys are like, well, let me talk to you a little bit, Kyle. Oh, yeah, that's what's wrong with you, right? The prophetic guy is going to go, blah blah blah. And this is how the church works, like completely together, right? Then we're going to be in a prayer meeting, right? Then we're going to be worshiping, and then somebody's going to be start speaking in tongues, right? Then somebody's going to interpret. And it's going to all be confirmational, and that's how we're going to go forward, right? This is how the church operates, right? This is, this is the only thing I want to leave you guys with, is that we are not a corporation. We're a collection of born-again supernatural people. Well, that's a room full of supernatural people that we haven't even come close. I mean, who feels like they've come close to untapping this and stuff that you see in the New Testament? You guys are the fulfillment of that, of that wish that Moses made in that tent that day. Right, don't miss the weight of that. When Moses said, man, I wish all God's people were prophets and they all had the spirit. And here you sit in 2015 and listen May. And you're the fulfillment of that. So, so don't take that as a, as a small thing. That's a really, really big thing. And I'm saying, um, a year from now, we're going to look back. And we're going to be like, man, you know, we were gathering, it was great, but we did we had no clue what it really meant to walk in the spirit. And now we're starting. This is what we're going to say a year from now. We're going to look back at, at us now. Right? John. <clears throat> I have seen so many churches that try to vote in truth, and they lose their perspective of where authority lies. If you have a hundred people in a room, and... 99 of those people want to vote one way and one, just one of them can stand up and show from the word of God where the 99 are wrong the one has more authority than the 99 because he stands on the word of God that's how God's church is to operate not by vote but by a thus saith the Lord believe me, I agree with you I agree with you all right, Kyle, <clears throat> pray us out, brother. God, we thank you again just for uh, your word and how it speaks to us.